Father, we are so grateful to you for providing this hour very graciously so that we could uh, join together and to learn from your scripture. Lord, I pray your spirit's leading may be given to us so that we may be able to understand and uh, explore the depths of your love, O oh Lord. Lead us and guide us, especially as Pastor Dan is teaching. I pray for your special mercies upon him so that we may be able to hear your voice through him, O oh God. The hour we spent in your presence in fellowship with one another may be a time of blessing in our lives and uh, it may encourage us and exhort us. Your name be exalted through everything that we speak, discuss and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Prabhi. Um, what I want to do uh, this evening is complete section 12 in our booklet and uh, the title of that particular section is God's grace. We have been talking about, uh, you know, what is God's grace and uh, how people need God's grace and why people need God's grace. And of course, in the last two Bible studies, we went into uh, a discussion on universalism because uh, it is a connected uh, subject with regards to God's grace. What I thought of doing today is to complete that section, we have two more questions to answer and I will hopefully uh, fill in with some extra details. Uh, and then as usual, we'll go into our discussion. Please feel free to ask questions or make any comments that will be adding to whatever I could cover. And then hopefully we will end up, end with a video uh, which uh, is uh, presented by Dr. Joseph Dikaj talking about uh, forgiveness, which is something that we are going to discuss today. So when we talk about God's grace, obviously the concept of forgiveness is uh, very much part of that entire package of God's grace. So let me go ahead and read from question five in uh, our booklet, uh, which is on page 44. Uh, yes, there we are, it's on your screen. Read along with, uh, with me or rather follow me as I read. The question reads, does our forgiveness of those who have harmed us depend on their repentance? Okay, so that's the question. Uh, obviously when we talk about God's grace, we are talking about God's grace towards us, but then we have then a responsibility also to show God's grace. And so the question is, does our forgiveness who have harmed us depend on their repentance? The answer goes like this. And obviously the first one is no. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. The gospel is the astonishing good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just as God's forgiveness of us is unconditional and proceeds, or rather precedes our confession of sin and our repentance, so our forgiveness of those who have harmed us does not depend on them confessing and repenting of their sin. However, when we forgive the person who has done us harm, Giving up any resentment or desire to retaliate, we do not condone the harm that was done, nor do we excuse the evil of the sin. Rather, we trust in God's judgment upon the evil, uh, the power of his redemption, and in the hopeful rescue and transformation of all who have done evil. There are a few thoughts I would like to pick up and uh, actually like to read from uh, a few scriptures that will sort of uh, uh, help us to sort of understand this a little bit more in detail. Obviously the answer to the question that was asked is no. That means to say, should we wait for somebody to repent before or ask or, or apologize before we extend our forgiveness? Does it mean that we must retain our forgiveness 
or rather not extend it until somebody apologizes? And the simple answer is no. Why? Because we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. In this respect, let me just read from the book of Matthew chapter 18. And I'm going to read several verses from there. Uh, and you will remember that there is this uh, uh, very popular uh, uh, parable, the parable of the two sons. Uh, I will not obviously expound on the parable in its entirety, but I'll just pick up a few thoughts from there. But let me first read from Matthew 18. Once again, we are doing this for us to understand how do we forgive others, all right? Matthew 18, verse 21, Peter approached him, Jesus, and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? So Peter asked the question, and uh, Jesus replied, I tell you, not as many as seven, but 70 times seven. Then let me go ahead and just read through that entire section there. It says, for this reason, I'm reading from verse 23 now. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle accounts, one who owed 10,000 talents was brought before him. Since he did not have the money to pay it back, his master commanded that he, his wife, his children, and everything he had be sold to pay the debt. At this, the servant fell face down before him and said, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. And then the master of that servant had compassion, released him and forgave him the loan. Uh, it goes on in verse 28, the, that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him, started choking him and said, pay what you owe. At this, the fellow servant fell down, began begging him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he wasn't willing. Instead, he went and threw him in prison until he could pay what he owed. When the other servants saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And because he was angry, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay everything that was owed. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, you are familiar with Peter's question and of course, uh, Jesus following his that answer with this parable, right? So what does it mean when, P, when Jesus says, no, not seven times? And of course, we have discussed this, I'm sure, uh, many a times, uh, you know, in many sermons from the past. Uh, Peter was trying to be very generous seven times, you know. I mean, uh, it uh, seems to be a very nice number also. <laughs> Uh, but Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. And we have always understood that to mean not 70 times seven, uh, 490 times. Is my math correct? <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, that is not what we understand it to be. Uh, Jesus is basically saying there is no limit. There is no, uh, you know, uh, sort of... Uh, boundary where you stop forgiving someone you must always remain uh you know uh, be willing to forgive and obviously what he means is we should never remain in an unforgiving attitude we should not adopt an unforgiving attitude we should not you know continue to stay you know seething inside against someone rather we should be willing to let go release so that is what I, we believe that Jesus meant when he said 70 times 7. Uh, another thought I'd like to pick up, and this is from the parable in verse 33. It says, should you also have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? So once again, there is this comparison made. We are supposed to show mercy as God has shown us mercy. 
And Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul in verse 13 says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. So we are given or we are put up under that obligation that we must forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. And obviously the question is, how has the Lord forgiven us? And I'd like to read Colossians 2 and verse 13. It says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. So God's forgiveness came before we could even even recognize that we were sinners. We were so dead in our sins, we wouldn't have even known that we are perishing. And yet, who is the initiator of the, uh, of the forgiveness? The initiator is God. If I can use another modern terminology, God is the first responder. Right? Let's say we were in an accident. Who came to rescue you? Uh, it was, you know, in this in this analogy, God became the first responder. So we are told to forgive as the Lord has forgiven. So obviously, when we look at that question, should we wait for somebody to apologize before we extend forgiveness? No. First and foremost, we quickly adopt an attitude of forgiveness. And if it is possible to actually extend it, you know, uh, in reality to the person, uh, you know, uh, so that the person understands we have forgiven them. I'd like to pick up just uh, two more thoughts from this uh, section before we move to that next question. Notice it also says, when we forgive, what we are doing is we are giving up any resentment or desire to retaliate. I just wanted to focus on those two things. You know, in other words, what does forgiveness include? Uh, when we forgive, what is it that we are actually trying to do or accomplish? Uh, we are giving up resentment. And I thought that was interesting, the way it is put. Why should we give up resentment? Resentment is uh, something where we continue to hold uh, something against the other person. In other words, resentment becomes a barrier. It becomes a barrier which breaks a relationship. Uh, it stops a relationship from being developed. So uh, we are to eliminate resentment in order that we are ready to restore the relationship. In other words, from our side, we are willing to let the relationship continue to move forward and to flourish. But resentment becomes a barrier uh, to, for that to take place. Uh, so that so that is the reason why we rec we consciously recognize that we must try to eliminate resentment. Also, it says we must give up the desire to retaliate or take revenge. Right? Why? Why is uh, that's also something that uh, biblically that's included? You see, if you take revenge, if you if you retaliate, then we become like the perpetrator, the perpetrator of the, you know, uh, the, the offense. So we also become offensive. And of course, once we also become offensive, uh, what we would say in the modern terminology, tit for tat, once again, that completely negates or takes away any opportunity to rebuild a relationship. We, we then are no different than the perpetrator, right? So we consciously not, uh, you know, uh, make sure that we don't take retaliatory action uh, so that we don't put a barrier for the relationship. That does not mean to say clarification. I just wanted to mention. That does not mean to say that you don't take protective measures against, you know, further abuse. You don't remain in a situation where you constantly are exposed to abuse. Uh, you obviously, you know, uh, take, uh, it's okay to take protective measures. It's, it's only right for you to take protective measures. 
But retaliation is something much more than a protective measure. So let's go back to the question then. The question asks, does our forgiveness of those who have harmed us depend on their repentance? And the answer is no. Uh, but is it, do we expect repentance? Does God expect repentance from us? Obviously he does. And the, re the way I understand it, the way I look at it is, repentance is an act of accepting forgiveness. It is not to, uh, you know, to earn forgiveness because we can't earn forgiveness. But repentance is an act of accepting forgiveness, right? Maybe we can, we can say that the perpetrator of the offense has recognized his or her folly and is ready to make amends. Just as we have recognized we are perishing and now we reach out to God and accept his grace, his forgiveness, make the amends that are necessary for us then to live in the fullness of that forgiveness. Those are some of the thoughts I'd like to leave you with. Let's go now to question number six. And uh, this is the last question in the section. Once again, I'll pick up a few thoughts from here and then we can get into the discussion. Question number six, uh, page 44, uh, Praveen. Okay, the question reads, how can people forgive those who have hurt them badly? How can people forgive those who have hurt them badly? In other words, is there... Is there any kind of offense or sin where we don't have to forgive, right? Uh, where we, uh, you know, we justify ourselves by saying, no, 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 that cannot be forgiven. Well, let's read the answer. We'll make some comments after that. Without the grace that comes from above, we cannot love our enemies. We cannot pray for those who persecute us. We cannot even be ready to forgive those who have hurt us badly. We cannot be conformed to the image of God's son apart from the power of God's word and spirit. Yet we are promised that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We never forgive others in our own names, but only in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> in our forgiveness, we trust that God has not allowed us to experience anything that in the end cannot be put right and redeemed. In our forgiveness, we hand over those who have sinned against us to God's own gracious judgment in the hope that they will one day submit to God's judgment, repent of their evil, die to themselves and be transformed by God's grace just as we have. Okay. Uh, let me pick up some thoughts there and I'd like to also read uh, two scriptures. Uh, you know, this is a question that I have been asked on occasion. You know, I mean, uh, some people come with a terrible hurt, right? Uh, people have been hurt terribly. Uh, give me that. Uh, uh, there's a loose connection in that uh, uh, table lamp. All right. And people, and when we say, well, the biblical, uh, the biblical standard is to forgive no matter what, you know, how severe the, the offense or how severely you have been hurt. And, they, and on many occasions, I've heard people say, well, I can't do that. I am not God. I cannot forgive. <laughs> right. In fact, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of this book. There's a book called I Cannot Forgive. Uh, it's written by an author called Rudolf Verba. Uh, he was, I think, a Polish, a Polish uh, per, uh, you know, individual who suffered the consequences of the Holocaust. But thankfully, he survived. I think he lost most of his family in the Holocaust. And... Uh, uh, he then penned down all his experiences in this book called I Cannot Forgive, uh, where he said that he had seen so much trauma, so much uh, evil being perpetrated against uh, others that he couldn't just come to forgive. 
uh, those who perpetrated, you know, who were the authors of the Holocaust? Well, uh, obviously, we cannot forgive from our own strength, uh, from our own, you know, resources, if you can, you know, use that emotional or spiritual resources. Uh, it has to be of God. Uh, it's impossible for us to forgive, genuinely forgive, right? Uh, without the grace that comes from God. As the answer says, without the grace that comes from above, we cannot love our enemies. Uh, we cannot uh, pray for those who persecute us. In this regard, uh, let me just turn to Romans chapter 7. Just to, uh, you know, help us understand that even the Apostle Paul recognized the fact that for us to be able to live as per the standards that God, you know, is laying down uh, is something just impossible of our own strength. Romans chapter 7, I'm sure you will remember what the Apostle Paul struggle is. Uh, let me read from verse 21. Uh, Romans chapter 7. So apostle, the Apostle Paul says, I discovered this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. Now remember, he's talking as a converted person. He's talking as a person who has accepted Christ, who has, uh, you know, in the process of regeneration, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the process of rebirth taking place. And look at the struggle he's going on. When I want to do what is good, evil is present with me. So he recognizes that it is very difficult. In spite of the fact that we have come uh, in, into faith in Christ, uh, there is evil still, you know, dogging us. He goes on to say in verse 22, for in my inner self, I delight in God's law. How do I delight? Because the Holy Spirit is in me. I've accepted Christ. Yes, I want to do. You know, and I delight and I want to do what is right. But verse 23 says, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin in the parts of my body. So he is uh, explaining how within, from within us, it is just impossible for us to adhere to those righteous standards. Uh, that God would expect of us. So what is the uh, what is the solution? Verse 24 tells us what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And of course, verse 25 comes the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in other words, only in Christ, only through the 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 indwelling of Christ, of course, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, can we be able or be enabled to extend that kind of forgiveness? It is not possible with, uh, you know, with our own strength. Now, in the answer, it also mentions, we never forgive others in our own names, but only in the name of Jesus. Uh, once again, uh, the way I understand this statement, it is basically trying to tell us we can't do it of our own strength. We can't do it in our own name, in, other, uh, in our own power or authority. We can't do that. It's just impossible. But we can do it in the name of Jesus. Right? And maybe <laughs> if any one of us is struggling to extend that, that forgiveness, at least you can mouth, mouth it. You know, I, I do it in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and maybe as you go along and Jesus strengthens you, the feelings will follow. You may not feel, you know, that sense of forgiveness straight away. But slowly, the Holy Spirit will help you uh, see that sense of, you know, or at least feel it in your heart. Okay. Um, now, there's one more thought I'd like to just dwell on and uh, read also a scripture. It mentions here, in our forgiveness, we trust that God has not allowed us to experience anything in the end cannot be put right and redeemed. I felt that was an interesting thought. Uh, 
what the apostle is, uh, or rather what, what we are beginning to understand there is, though sometimes we go through very, very severe times, uh, extremely difficult circumstances or experiences, uh, the power of God or the grace of God is much greater than what we experience. Uh, that is something that maybe will help us to be able to recognize or, or, or live with a sense of hope. We might think all is lost. We might think we have been done tremendous injustice. But as Christians who believe in Jesus, what we must keep in mind is that in the end, it will be put right. Now, we can't explain how. We can't go into the details of trying to say, how will this thing be put right? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, but we are promised that it will be put right. Okay. Let me just read, uh, uh, you know, uh, just read Genesis chapter 50. Uh, you all remember the story of Joseph. And uh, one interesting statement I'd like to pick up uh, from Genesis chapter 50, uh, dropping down to verse 19. Uh, I'm not going to the, through the story. You already know the story about Joseph, how he was treated so badly, sold off into slavery. And then, of course, more injustice done to him, false uh, accusations and all of that, right? Um, um, you know, and uh, it comes to the point where his brothers now are afraid of Joseph. You remember Joseph was elevated to be the prime minister. Uh, and the brothers are afraid. What's Joseph going to do to us? Is he going to kill us? And so... The answer that Joseph gives when the brothers express their fear, this is what he says. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And verse 20 is something that I think is very, very uh, you know, helpful and hopeful for us. You plan evil against me, but God planned it for good to bring about the present result. Right? So though people plan evil against us, though people do evil against us, God is in a position to put it right. God is in a position to somehow bring it to a point where whatever the offense will probably pale into insignificance when we experience the grace of God and, of course, the fullness of his grace in uh, in the kingdom, uh, we will recognize that that offense was nothing. I mean, I am not minimizing the offense that we feel today. I mean, people have uh, great, great uh, traumas to struggle through. Uh, just today, I came to hear you probably all wrote, uh, Mrs. Ruth Matthews. Uh, uh, this is Rod Matthews' wife. Uh, she went through, she's a cancer survivor. She went through cancer and just recently uh, she sent a message saying that she lost her younger brother who was like a kid brother to her and she was hurting so tremendously. Uh, you know, uh, maybe they had a very close relationship. And so she was just mentioning that, um, you know, it hurts so much, but uh, only God can put that right. Only God can help us to see beyond that uh, to a time when we are able to experience his grace in all his, in all his fullness. Uh, that is what I'd like to leave you with uh, today in terms of uh, our study. Let's get into our discussion now. Feel free to make any comments that might add to uh, some of the comments I have made. If you have any questions, feel free to do so, after which hopefully uh, towards the later part we will uh, I'll play you a video and we can end by the, with that. Okay, the floor is open now. Go ahead. Rekha, you have a thought? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of these verses, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So that really helps us to remember that God is in charge and he will look after us. 
And also I thought about uh, Corinthians when, when Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So right. when we are feeling worse, it's always better. That's where God takes over. Yes, uh, yeah, those verses, of course, uh, once again, add to all that we have, we have said. Uh, when, God, when the apostle says, vengeance is mine, I shall repay. I mean, it's a, I mean, it's a very powerful verse, scary to some extent. Uh, all the wait. more, for, sorry, Anil, uh, what were you saying? But then you wait for God to take the vengeance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but we do what we need to do and that is, you know, extend forgiveness. Suri Murthy, you have a thought? Uh, you are still muted, Surya Murthy. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. In my personal life, I have seen this verse work several times. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And most of the time, those people who have harmed me have repeatedly been made my closest friend, closest friends. <laughs> okay. That is how I feel God has repaid. Right. That's interesting uh, <laughs> that they became your friends. But of closest course, uh, <laughs> yeah, of course, uh, I don't think we should uh, <laughs> sort of... Uh, dwell on that so much that we are longing for vengeance, but I don't want to do it, God. <laughs> you know, like the sons of thunder, strike them down. <laughs> Obviously, we don't want to have such an attitude, right? Yes, Bertie, go ahead. Yeah, Jesus Christ is a very example, the Bible says. And uh, Christ is in us, as Rekha says, as Surimuti said, when you follow God's word and, uh, you know, take it to heart, and acknowledge God that uh, his word is right and that it's strength to, our, strength to us, his way of life. It does make a big, big difference because Christ said he is our example. Even when he suffered, he did not threaten. Sometimes <laughs> I in weakness, you know, feel when you suffer, I think any of us, when we suffer sometimes, we tend to, you know, uh, we tend to, uh, when he suffered, he did not threaten. Yeah, the Bible says, besides being in the very nature of God, he did not consider clinging to it as, you know, but humbled himself. Then at the end of that uh, verse, it says that uh, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed judgment to God, who judges righteously. So as we all are saying, Christ, as you said, uh, I thank God, uh, Christ Jesus is there for us. You know, he is our grace. So as uh, we will all be comforted and strengthened if we know that. Okay, thank you, Bertie. Yes, very true. Uh, I think this gives us the strength and all of this helps us to be able to uh, do those things, you know, uh, that God wants us to do. Anil, you had a thought? Yeah, I read somewhere that, you know, um, if you keep it inside and allow it to fester and you're uh, wishing bad for the other guy, it's like you're drinking poison, but expecting the other guy to die. Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, I think that is probably uh, a discovery of modern psychology. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, we don't get that from the Bible, even though in the book of Proverbs, I think uh, there is a verse, uh, something like, I, I can't remember it exactly. Is it, is it, does it go like this? Anger is rottenness to the bones. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Something like that, right? So uh, modern psychology recognizes that uh, these kinds of uh, attitudes, if retained, is very stressful. And the stress, obviously, is something that eats you up, like you mentioned, poison. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't uh, really help. Right. Very true. Praveen, you had a thought? Yeah, I, I would like to make a couple of uh, comments on uh, the statement uh, uh, the vengeance belong to the Lord. Uh, actually, I would like to put it in uh, its context. Uh, we need to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If you if you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we find uh, uh, God used certain kind of statements in uh, uh, each era of 
human evolution. As we are growing as in the history of Israel, we can find how we humans have grow, uh, grown. So if you read, uh, sorry, if you see the story, uh, the story of uh, Cain, it says, you know, Cain killed Abel and there is a mark on Cain's head. And then it said, uh, it was said, if anybody hurts Cain, the vengeance will be taken seven times. And uh, so what was there was when humanity fell, no, sorry, when the humanity was fallen, there was no way to control the violence. Violence has been started with Cain and there is no way to control it. So people were taking vengeance however they want. And in the during the time of Noah, it is said the world, the earth was full of violence. It is a, in some, some translations clearly say those days there was so much of violence. If somebody kills, uh, beats one and uh, they come and kill the entire family and go. That was the situation. So Cain time, it said vengeance is taken seven times. And then um, uh, you, you go, if you move a little more forward, Lamech comes. Lamech is also in the Cain's line. He also says he takes two wives and says, if anybody uh, hurts me and the vengeance will be taken like the Cain and it will be more. Like if you come and beat me, I'll, ki I'll kill your entire family, in other words. So there is no control for the violence. So that was a situation of the world of those days. If God comes to them and says, forgive your enemies, they would not be able to understand it. So they were not grown. They were not able to uh, think about all these stuff. So what God, we can, what we can see in the Bible is God started working with humans. He is working with them step by step, bringing them, uh, working in their lives, bringing commandments in their lives. And ultimately, he revealed everything through Jesus Christ. So once uh, it was like a vengeance was one uh, will be taken seven times or however it is, then comes the law. There God says, eye for an eye, truth for a truth. You are not going to take vengeance however you want. That is the first step. You are going to take the vengeance equally. If somebody slap you one, you are going to slap only one cheek. You have somebody pluck one eye, you are going to pluck one eye on. But still, that is not fair. That is not justice of God yet. But it is because we humans are not able to understand it. So step by step. And then, then, then comes the next step. He told, uh, vengeance belongs to me. It is not you who are, if somebody beats you, it is not who you who are going to take vengeance or revenge. You are going to leave it on me. So, so in the second step, people might be like, you know, okay, God, this fellow hurted me, he did hurt me. I'm really angry. But as David prays, these people are around me like dogs and you come and kill them. Do this, do that. We find it in the Psalms. So that is the next step. And then comes the third step. Jesus comes and says, if somebody hurt you, do not hurt them back and forgive your enemies and that is the third step and then the fourth step is not just forgiving your enemies love your enemies <laughs> that's what god does so the, the ultimate message god wanted to tell us is love your enemies that is the only way you can put into violence how he did that he has shown that through jesus christ jesus christ on the cross received the violence of entire humanity the horrible violence a person can ever experience. He has taken that and ultimately he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He set an example so that the, the life of Jesus itself is a message. So being Cain, when Cain sister, Cain thing came, it is seven times, two times, seven times and there was no limit. Then God started putting barriers to all of them. God started taking humanity through a journey. And he said, vengeance can be taken only one time. Then later it is said, you are not going to take that vengeance. I'm going to take that vengeance. And at last he said, my way is for the way of forgiveness. And you are to forgive. So he brought humanity through this journey. So what the reason, the point I would like to tell from this is, we, we sometimes certain words we take in the, we take in the Bible, they may be, they may give us emotionally comfort. Emotionally comfort us at a point of time, but as far as only the studying of the scripture is concerned, 
so those things have to be seen in the context so when vengeance belongs to the lord that verse is read it's it, uh, it does not translate to us as god this fellow hurted me i'm looking for your uh, fire coming from heaven to burn him that is not the message of that particular verse so that's something i would like to your notice right thank you praveen i think that's a, a good perspective for that particular verse so god's vengeance is actually his forgiveness <laughs> isn't it amazing and no wonder why suri murthy got so many friends <laughs> and then he became friends <laughs> yeah that is another statement like actually somebody said uh, god in bible it is written many places that god uh, god is going to destroy his enemies that god is going to destroy his enemies by making them friends <laughs> <laughs> right yeah uh somewhere in the uh, uh, i think it's the apostle paul who also says uh, uh you know if you if you by not taking vengeance if you actually show love it's like heaping uh, <laughs> james james he says that james okay uh coals of fire on keeping right. coals of fire on one side right something like that yeah uh yeah amazing how uh, how god's perspective is and no wonder he said my ways are higher than he always yeah right franklin you had a thought i i noticed you had uh, uh, unmuted you sir okay yes. right. no sir nothing nothing okay all right okay any other questions or thoughts uh, uh yes surimurthy go ahead the parable of the debtor right now i i don't have the material for that there is something important in the parable about the hebrew language which was used there so next week i will tell you the importance of that this okay. several times the word pay 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 is used right why it is used to, uh, next time i will prepare and tell you all right, right now we'll uh, we will look forward to that you know maybe you can add something uh, uh looks like you're also becoming a hebrew scholar <laughs> uh but i'm not sure if uh, if uh, that is from the book of matthew and it was written in greek wasn't it no it was written in hebrew was it written in hebrew well of course he was writing to the hebrews uh, to the jews so i'm not sure i i we need to check that has been confirmed with jerome jerome who wrote the latin vulgate it has been confirmed confirmed by eusebius who okay. is quoting another church father at the time right the, they say matthew wrote the letter in hebrew and many other people attempted to translate it as much possible as they could because it was very difficult to translate from hebrew to greek so two people have confirmed so what we have been hearing so far yeah that matthew was written first in greek is not correct okay all right we'll look forward to some of your scholarship there next time uh what we'll do now is uh, i uh, since time is fleeting uh, let's go and uh, see that video you know the last question we were discussing is how can people forgive those who have hurt them badly and i thought this video shows something or, or uh, is a story about a lady who was hurt so badly and yet let us see how she responds to it uh, this is uh, speaking of life praveen if you can play that for us For most of us, Mother's Day is an opportunity to celebrate the love between a parent and their children. 
But for Deborah Cotton, Mother's Day will always be the story of a different kind of love. Deborah is a journalist and a longtime advocate for nonviolence and social action who sacrificed years of her career to help disadvantaged neighborhoods in her beloved New Orleans. But on Mother's Day in 2013, that all changed when she was one of 20 people injured in a mass shooting during a parade in the 7th Ward. When two gang members opened fire into the crowd of innocent bystanders, Deborah was hit in the abdomen and a bullet tore through several vital organs. 30 surgeries later, she survived. But she would forever carry the scars, a reminder of the high cost of her service to her community. She now also faced a choice about what Mother's Day would mean to her moving forward. Would it mean reliving the horrific memory of that day and the pain that came with it? Or would she choose to turn her tragedy into something positive through forgiveness and love? Amazingly, Deborah chose love. She reached out to the man who shot her and visited him in prison. She wanted to hear his story and understand why he would do something so violent. Since her first visit, Deborah has helped her shooter turn his life around, focusing specifically on his spiritual transformation in relationship to our triune God. When I heard about this incredible story, I couldn't help but think of the life-changing love of our own amazing Savior. Like Deborah, he too carries the scars of love, eternal reminders of the high cost of his work to redeem humankind. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. And the amazing thing Jesus did this willingly. He knew before his death the pain he was about to enter into. But instead of turning away, the sinless Son of God voluntarily assumed the entire cost to judge and bring to an end all of humanity's sin, to reconcile us to God and deliver us from evil and eternal death. He even prayed for his Father to forgive the very men who were crucifying him. His love truly knows no bounds, and it's so heartening to see signs of his reconciling and transforming love spread through the world today by people like Deborah, who chose love over condemnation, forgiveness rather than retribution. And this Mother's Day, we can all be inspired by her example as she depended upon and followed Jesus Christ to go out and do likewise. I'm Joseph Tkach, speaking of life. Uh, just a few takeaways, uh, you know, talking about scars. I'm sure all of us have some scars uh, that reminds us of terrible things that happened, right? Uh, we all do, but uh, hopefully, you know, in, 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 the, uh, in the strength that Jesus gives us, we can move past that. Uh, also, forgiveness can be a very powerful testimony, like what she did uh, through her forgiveness, that man, the shooter, you know, came to reform his life. And finally, isn't it interesting that Jesus Christ actually retains the wounds because he asked Thomas to put, you know, his uh, finger into those wounds. Uh, maybe a reminder for all eternity of the tremendous love that God has for us. Any final thoughts? Otherwise, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, which uh, will be our uh, last Wednesday, our last Bible study for the year 2020. We will then reconvene in 21. And we'll, next time, we will also look forward to uh, Surya Murthy's thoughts on uh, the parable. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, Mari, can I uh, call you on WhatsApp after this? something I wanted to talk about. Sure. Yes. Yes. Go ahead. I will. Thank you very much again. And uh, let me see. I, I keep forgetting who all I asked, uh, you know, to end with prayer. I don't know if I asked Surya Murthy to do that. Surya Murthy, could you, you haven't, you haven't prayed uh, with us. So can you do the prayer?
closing prayer? Uh, Father in heaven, thank you, for, thank you for bringing us together for this Bible study. We have learned a lot about <coughs> not having grudge against others, not having resentment others, not not thinking of retaliating others. Still, as as we were told, there are scars, very deep deep scars, which we keep to ourselves. But still, we carry on in our lives. Only God can heal all the scars completely. Thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity to having this Bible study every week. We also thank you for, for our brethren who are participating in this Bible study and sharing the knowledge. Thank you, God. We all say this in Jesus' name. Thank you. Amen. Amen.